Let's start with the big question. Who is God? <laughs> according to Christianity, according to Catholicism, who's God? I'll give you Thomas Aquinas' definition. Uh, God is ipsum esse subsistens. God is the subsistent act of to be itself. Another way to state that in Aquinas is God is that reality, unique, absolutely unique, in which essence and existence coincide. To be God is to be to be. Those are all ways of talking about what we mean by God. They are kind of gnomic, and, and that's on purpose. There's almost a Zen koan kind of quality about the way we talk about God. I'm saying something that's substantive, but it's more in like a via negativa mode. It's more like what God is not, because there's nothing in the world that would correspond to those descriptions. So anything in the world would be a being of some type or an event of some type, some particular mode of existence. And God is not an entity in the world. In fact, I would say that's the fundamental mistake that atheists old and new make all the time, is they think of God as a big being. When Aquinas says that God is not in any genus, even the genus of being, it's one of the strangest remarks in the whole tradition, but it's really interesting. So you say, well, at the very least, God must be a being, right? And Aquinas' answer is no, he's not in the genus of being. So we talk about God being beyond being and so on. To say in God, essence and existence coincide is to say God's very nature is to be. And that can't be true of any contingent thing in the world. So what I'm doing there is I'm, I'm gesturing the way the tradition does toward God, using language that's at the same time philosophically precise and gnomic. You know, it's, it's both accurate. It's true. In God, essence and existence coincide. What God is is the same as God's uh, active to be. But now what does that mean? <laughs> I'm not quite sure because nothing in our ordinary experience corresponds to that. Everything in our experience is is a being of some type. So it's existence received according to the mode of some essence. That's not true of God, which is why he can't be found in the world. And, and that's, as I say, the fundamental mistake is, uh, oh, I guess theists are those that believe there's this being alongside the other beings in the universe. And then atheists say, oh, no, there is no such being. Um, and that's precisely wrong. That's just a category error. Dawkins, I think, cites Bertrand Russell to the effect that proving the non-existence of God is a bit like proving the non-existence of a China teapot orbiting between Earth and Mars. And you know, no, that's precisely what God is not, some entity that's sort of hidden among the other entities of the universe. God is the reason why there's a contingent realm at all. That's the way to put it. In more theological language, God's the creator of all things. So if God is outside of our world, is it possible for us to visualize, to comprehend, to know God? Not utterly, of course. And I would say our knowledge begins always in this world, begins in ordinary experience. But I think we can, through metaphysical analysis, through philosophical reasoning, can come to some knowledge of a reality which is transcendent to our experience. So we gesture toward it. I, I always like Aquinas who says the language about God that we use is analogical. So it's not, it's not univocal, meaning what I say about that you know, can or about this bottle, I can say about God. No, that makes God an entity. At the same time, it's not simply equivocal. So if I say, well, that thing is and God is, I mean totally different things. No, no. I mean something analogous. Mm -hmm. So to be God is to be to be. So the real meaning of being is the being of God. The being of that thing or this thing or the being of galaxies or subatomic particles would be analogous to God's manner of being. So on that basis, I can make some statements. I can, I can theorize. And even at the limit, as you suggest, I can visualize. So we have metaphors for God and the Bible is replete with those, right? So God is a rock. Uh, you know, God's like a lion. God's like this and that. Or he, the Bible will sometimes imagine God as a as a human being walking around. You know, now only the crudest fundamentalism would say, "Well, that's a univocal, accurate dis description of God. It's an image that's catching something of God's manner of being." Then, what does it mean to believe in God? So there's a word, and we have to limit ourselves to human interpretable words today. Mm -hmm. There's a word called faith. What does faith mean? So if we can't really directly know God, 
you kind of sneak up to the idea of God with metaphors. Better, he sneaks up on us. Because I, I like the language of grace. God's action comes first. So if I stay perfectly within the realm of I'm seeking with my kind of eagle eyes and, and my inquiring mind, I'm not going to find God that way. I, I might find a path that opens up, but I would say finally God finds me. And I think then the language of faith begins to make more sense. Um, I, I'm with Paul Tillich, though, the Protestant theologian, said the most misunderstood word in the religious vocabulary is faith. Because he said the way we take it usually is something subrational. You know, I have I have uh, proof of this. I I really know this, and I only kind of believe that. Like I, that's just a personal opinion or impression. But that's to identify faith with the kind of infra rational, and and that's not it. I mean, I, I don't want something infra rational. I don't want superstition or or childish credulity. So authentic faith is is the darkness beyond reason and on the far side of reason. It's it's supra rational, not infra rational. And that's a very important move. At the limit of what I can know, at the limit of my striving and my vision, there's this uh, horizon that opens up. And I think that's true even in ordinary ways of knowing. There's a kind of a horizon that lures us beyond what I've got. Faith has to do more with that kind of darkness rather than a darkness prior to reason. The darkness beyond the horizon prior to reason. First of all, the poetry of your language is incredible. To be, to be. Yeah. I have a million questions. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I do too. On this. Uh, so first of all, let me just jump around. Uh, you mentioned to be to be a few times. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, to be me is to be a human being, right? Yeah. To be this is to be a table, to be this is to be a microphone. So it's, I'll use Aquinas' language. It's the act of being poured, if you want, into the receptacle of some essential principle. So it's got a ontological structure. It's it's an existent it's a thing that exists, but it's it's existing in a limited way according to essential principle. Uh, God, so well, who, what's God? What's God's name? What kind of being is He? We'll go back to Moses now. Um, when the Israelites ask me, you know, what's your name? What shall I tell them? And he says, you know, famously, I am who I am. But see, Aquinas reads that as a very accurate remark. <laughs> so Moses is wondering. Okay, there's a lot of gods and there's a lot of things, a lot of entities. Well, which one are you? You got to be one of them. So tell me your name. In philosophical language, give me the essence that receives your act of existing, right? And God's answer blows the mind of, of Moses and the whole tradition. I am who I am. To be God is to be. So I'm not this or that. I'm not up or down. I'm not here or there. God is that whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere, as as the mystics put it. Now can I get a clear and distinct idea of that? No. And in a way, that's the whole point. If I could, I'd be talking about a being of some kind. So to be God is to be, to be is to, and that's, you know, Moses, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. So I'm going to go over confidently and find out what this thing is, this burning bush. I'm going to find out. No, no, no. Take off your shoes, you're on holy ground, because you're not in charge here. You're not in command. Because if you got shoes on, you can walk wherever you want. You can walk with confidence, but you take your shoes off, you're much more vulnerable. Uh, and that's appropriate when you're talking about God, you know? But here's another interesting thing. I didn't think about the burning bush in, in, in this connection before, but it's a bush that's on fire but not consumed. Is Beings are competitive with each other. And so I, th these can't be in the same place at the same time, these two beings. They're, they're mutually exclusive if you want. But as God comes close to a creature, he doesn't destroy it or consume it, hmm. but the creature becomes more beautiful and more radiant, right? And see, compare it to the, to the classical gods and goddesses. When, when they come bursting into life and experience, things are incinerated and, and people give way and they're overwhelmed. Then there's this biblical idea of God comes close and sets things on fire, but doesn't burn them up. And that's because he's not a competitive being in the world. If he were a big being, then he'd be in this, he'd be competing for space, so to speak, on the same ontological grid. But he's not like that. So God can come close and we come more fully alive. Now we're starting to gesture toward the incarnation. I mean, the central Christian doctrine that God can actually become a human without overwhelming the human he becomes, right? 
So I mean, that's that's kind of the next step. But the basic idea of God is non-competitively transcendent to the world. That's another way to get at it. Non-competitively transcendent to the world. So it's beyond being, is the source of being. Right. Let me make it maybe more, more um, imagistic. I think a really good analogy would be author to book, right? So uh, like Tolkien or someone that writes one of these you know, big, sprawling novels. And, and Tolkien's good too because he creates a whole world. He mm-hmm. creates a new nature, a new language, new history, all that. Think of you know the thousands of characters and the plots and subplots and all of it. Tolkien is utterly responsible for every bit of that story, right? Every character, every plot, every subplot, every description, he's completely responsible. He's involved in every nook and cranny of it. But he's not in the story. He's not in the book. You're not going to find him as a character in the book. So that's the category mistake of, of the atheist in a way is, I'm looking for God. He's, he's a character in this story somewhere. No, he's the author of the story, mysteriously present to every aspect of the story, but not a character in it. Right. He is deeply in the story somehow. He's right. present, but he's not... Uh... There, even if he is a character, he's not really the full embodiment is not a character. And people inside the book can't really know about the author. Because- right. <laughs> no, right. Well, see, Augustine says God is simultaneously intimior intimo meo et superior sumo meo. He's closer to me than I am to myself, and he's higher than anything I could possibly imagine at the same time. But see, once you get the the insight that God is is the sheer act of to be. Well, of course that's true. So right now, God is sustaining us in existence. True. Aquinas says God is in all things by essence, presence, and power, and most intimately so. And, and he's nowhere in this room. Okay, well, where's God? He's nowhere in this room. He's totaliter aliter, we say. He's totally other. Same time. But but once you crack that code, though, I think you see it of like why that would be true. And see, now I'm getting from more philosophical language to more mystical language, because all the mystics talk that way in these high paradoxes about God's availability and unavailability. I, I, I've often thought in the Bible, story after story, God can neither be grasped nor hidden from. So the, the first sinful instinct is to grasp at God. I've got him. I've, I understand him. I can, I can manipulate him. No, no, no. It's story after story is told you can't do that. Well, then the other extreme of the sinner, all right, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run from God. I'm going to avoid God. Jonah and the whale, you know, so he, he has the call from God and it's, no, no, I, I'm going to refuse that. I'm going to run as far away. I'm going to go to Tarshish, which meant like Timbuktu for them at the end of the world. God's got the whale swallows him up and brings him right back where God wants him. It's a you know poetic way of saying you can't escape the press of God. At the same time, Tower of Babel. I'm going to build a tower up to God. I'm going to I'm going to grab hold of God. No, 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 you can't do that either. <laughs> so live in the space in between those two things, which would be the space of friendship with God, uh, falling in love with God is neither grasping nor hiding from God. 